This week on The Perspective with Mike Sherbineau and Julie Stoutland. Confidence is a tricky thing in a world that is constantly telling us what we don't have and what we need. From good looks, electronics, houses, jobs, the list is endless. Of course, the most valuable kind of confidence comes from within and never forgetting God's confidence in us. Jesus makes it very clear he is with us, yet still the things of this world and that nagging voice inside can make us doubt. All this week, we look at healthy self-worth and the art of not striving but being still in Jesus. Ruth Jo Simmons is an artist and speaker with the pulse on women and self-worth and how to move forward in faith and in God's light. And most importantly, the miracles that happen when we cease to strive. Plus, Shannon Perry is an author, singer, coach, and TV host who knows that religion is a whole different thing than having a personal relationship with Jesus. Shannon's work helps women navigate our different chapters with grace and guts. Plus, author David Pruitt is here to talk about his latest book, Relative Distance, a memoir full of brutal honesty about brothers being raised by a violent, abusive father and a detached, mentally ill mother. An examination of the role played by family and society in individual homelessness. Welcome to The Perspective. And as you can tell, we're in for a, a very interesting week. Uh, before we jump in, Julie, it's nice to see you again. Good to see you too. What'd you do over the weekend? What exciting things did you and Tor well, get up to? Well, one of the things we did, we went to a craft show. That is not exciting. It is exciting. I love <laughs> not poking my around voice. and all the little vendors. And Does like, he love it or tolerate it? Or is no, this part no, of his he, marital no, duty? No, no, he, he enjoys it. We like meandering around. Maybe and... you should just ask me what I did. Okay, well, what about you? What did well, you do? Well, I, I got to go to the west coast of Canada and I saw some of my daughters Oh, nice. uh, some of them are out there, and we tried to get as many as possible to get together. Aww. Saw my granddaughters, so we had fun. Went Grandpa to the, time is always important. Yeah, we went to the kangaroo farm. Ooh. Oh, that was pretty exciting. We'd do a whole show on that, but we're not. <laughs> we have something far more exciting to talk about than kangaroos. We have a speaker and author and entrepreneur. Uh, Ruth Jo Simons is with us, and uh, she's got her pulse on the beat of women in the Christian community. And uh, Ruth, we're delighted that you're with us yes. today. Thanks for coming on the program. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. And uh, we're going to have a bit of fun together. You have six boys, so our prayers, sympathies, and congratulations. <laughs> You need an award. That's you need right. an award. You get an award for that. I need somebody that. to send some money for my grocery bill. That's Thanks. what I need. Oh, my goodness. I didn't even think about that. Absolutely right oh there. Oh, my goodness. Like, how many loaves of bread do you go through in a day? Well, let's just start there. It's a there. legitimate question. Yes, my oldest is 20 and my youngest is nine. Oh. And we've got some guys who are working out these days packing on the calories. So um, it's not um, unheard of to be fixing 24 to 36 eggs in the morning. You know, you have many more years ahead of you of running out of food. It's true. I just find it fascinating. Forget what else we're going to talk about. Let's just go about the diet and how you feed all those guys. And I have five daughters, as I was sharing with you, and granddaughters. So there's no guys. And, uh, but they can hold their own when it comes to eating food, but not quite that many eggs. Uh, that just doesn't happen. Um, tell us how you manage motherhood, your art, and your ministry. I think that's a good place to start. Thanks for asking. Well, um, I don't do it all, and I choose, and I think carefully about what season I'm in. And so, yes, it's, it seems like I'm doing a lot of things, but I wasn't always doing everything that you see publicly these days. Mm -hmm. I um, am in this current season really grateful to be running a company and to be using my creative gifts in writing and speaking and creating artwork. But um, many, many years I was doing those things behind the scenes as I was raising my young boys. And um, in this season of life, I'm grateful that there's more bandwidth to, to pursue some of these creative endeavors. Why do you think society assigns uh, our self-worth, let's go there, based on what we do rather than who we are and whose we are? How do we work through this? Well, I'll, I'll say just in response to even your question about how I do all the things that I do, you know, about 10, 15 years ago, early in motherhood, I would open up social media and that was, you know, early days of social media, mm -hmm. media even, and you immediately see what everybody else is doing, right? Yeah. It's so easy to use compare to 
fall into the trap of comparison Mm. or to allow seeing somebody else's life dictate what you believe about your own. And so it's really easy for women to think, well, that woman is doing it all, or see, she's using her gifts. The ship has passed me by. I won't get to use my gifts in a certain way. And I think it can feel really overwhelming. And so we start looking to um, what we do, how much we achieve, or um, how much approval we get even online to try and define our sense of self-worth. I think it's a trap many of us fall into. Mm. So true. You know, Ruth, as, as you're talking about that, this whole issue of our self-esteem and our self-worth, um, I think you would agree with me that it's a very, it's a slippery slope that we can be on. Uh, I'm intrigued how you speak into the life of your boys. I'm thinking I just got to reconnect with some of my adult uh, daughters and then our granddaughters. And it's really easy to say, oh, tell me what you're doing. And I have one granddaughter who's a great swimmer. The other one loves hockey and she's a hockey player. (laughs) And because that's my background, it's really easy for me to go and say, tell me about your hockey. And you can get all caught up in that. But I realize I need to ask better questions. What are some of those questions? And how are you shaping your boys with the whole thing of self-esteem? Because guys are competitive. Well, girls are too. But guys are just wired to fight and to uh, conquer. Well, and it's so easy also as a parent to immediately think to what kinds of grades are you getting? Are you doing well in school? Are you making lots of friends? Show me all that you have accomplished, right? It's so easy to, um, in the, in our hustle age to try to boil it down to show me your report card. And so I have to really work against that natural state in myself to measure my own life or anybody else's, including my kids. And so one of the things that I try to do really regularly and uh, just a practical way about it is always check, do heart checks first, right? To always think, um, you know, it is important that I have a gauge on how they're doing in school or what they're learning, but more important than that, I need to ask the question, how are you? Mm. What are you thinking? What are you feeling? What's going on in your heart right now? What's discouraging you? And rather than Mm. asking yes or no questions like, how was your day? Or do you have a good day at school? That's a very, ah, sure kind of answer, right? But rather ask things like, what was one thing today that kind of changed the mood? Like what what brought Mm. you down a little bit today? That then the the answer actually has to be something a little more descriptive or something like, did you feel like you were really seen and known and loved by your friends today? Mm. What made you not feel that way? Or how did you get along with your brothers today? What was one interaction that caused you to feel really frustrated? Yeah. Those are questions that begin the conversation of what's really going on inside. And this team that lives at, in our home, well, we have several teams, but we may have a team that has a really bad day. And mm. rather than what, what's going on? What's wrong with you? Did you have a bad day at school? Which is really a yes or no answer. You can start with, um, hey, let's do a heart check. What has been the most frustrating part of your day? And then that's an invitation that, that says, I care more about who you are than what you do. So you have six mm, boys, cool. like, do you just line them up and go through these questions? <laughs> or is it just kind of you know, happen teachable? sporadically throughout the week? It's teachable moments, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, if you if you say, okay, this is the time allotted and we're going to go down the line and ask everybody, I mean, you can at dinner time do highs and lows of your day and say, hey, we're going to go around and share. Sure, absolutely. Bring that into the rhythm of your day. But you know what I found means more to our kids than just systematically, routinely going down obligatory questions is to take moments out of your busy busy schedule, choosing not to listen to a podcast when you're doing a grocery run, choosing not to reply to texts or call your friend or multitask, Mm -hmm. but rather say, hey, let's have a conversation when we're in traffic or choosing to do dishes with them and say, okay, let's have a conversation while we're doing dishes because you kind of have a captive audience when you're trying to do something together. Well, listen, I want to step back for a moment and and ask you, referring to heart check, about your own heart check. I know myself, I have uh, two grown daughters. One, I just became mother of bride three weeks ago or so, and uh, trying to get used to that. But I never thought I would be a mother. I was, that was just not my thing. And I, God has taken me through different paths. And you've shared that before yourself, that you felt you know, how God has used you and how you ended up this way. What what, what process did you go through with your own heart check, finding yourself yeah. now a mom with six boys and, and involved this way and God using you this way? Well, I'll be honest and say, I 
I, for one, love to sign up to do things that I feel really good at. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are several things that you could say, Ruth, would you like to do that? And I would say, you know, I'm going to nail that and I'm going to be so good at it. (laughs) Sign me up. Motherhood's not one of those things. It's not a daily display of my greatness in patience or organization (laughs) or um, it's, it's truly not a broadcasting of my greatest strengths. And so it is actually hard to sign up and stay faithful and be present for something that you're not going to be um, acing or doing amazing. Right. You're not going to win any awards for this. Right. And so it's been certainly a process. And I always say that I'm an unlikely mama to six boys. And I do sneak in there. I usually say this because I, most people gasp for a second when they hear this. And I usually say, you know, we weren't just trying for a girl. Um, we do own a TV and we do know what causes it. So I'll just get that <laughs> out of the way. I always, I always throw that in there because, because people are always wondering, were you just trying for a girl? No, we really fell in love with having a big family. But I really, for for sure felt like an unlikely mama. And so what I'd like to tell other moms who might go, oh, you must have six kids because you're super patient. I would say, no, honestly, I think that it's God's mercy that Mm -hmm. sometimes we are called to do things and do and serve in roles that we don't feel quite great at and that we can be weak in because God's word actually tells us that God shows his strength in our weakness. Meaning, the very things that we feel like are maybe not the best of our best that we have to actually like be weak in and surrendered in and mm-hmm. have to be teachable in are the very things that we can see how God is strong and we don't have to be. Ruth, I so resonate with what you've just said. Um, listen, we have to take a quick break, but we're going to be right back with more with Ruth Jo Simmons. Stay with us. There's a still and quiet place we all long to know. It's peaceful and steadfast. A place where we don't wonder if we belong. We don't clamor for approval. We don't fret about disappointing others. We don't live in fear of failure. But right here, in the middle of the pressures, expectations, and desire for approval, we can't help but ask, If we believe Jesus is all we need, then why do we live our days worn out, fearful, and anxiously striving? All right, we're here today speaking with Ruth Jo Simmons, and I have to just make another comment. I was, like I said before the break, I so resonate with what you said about being an unlikely mother. I don't know how many times I've said from the laundry room, I was made for more than just laundry. I hope you all realize this. Okay, well, you know what? I'm not going to do any counseling on this program, but uh, Ruth, we're glad you're with us. And uh, you're going to help us sort out all these things pertaining to life. And as we're joking a little bit in between, although my mind was there, I'm just trying to figure out 24 to 36 eggs a day. Like I was just scrambled, fried, (laughs) side by each. Anyways, we're going to leave our uh, listeners to uh, ponder all of that, how you manage it. But let's, uh, let's take it and go into the question, how do we get tricked uh, into keeping up with the Joneses? Uh, how do you sort that out? Why is the world and our ego so difficult and uh, a challenging to tame? What suggestions are you giving people? Well, here's the thing. Everywhere we look, every aisle you walk down, every bookstore you walk through, there are formulas constantly vying for our attention, telling us that if you just do this, you'll Mm -hmm. have the best life possible. Mm -hmm. You'll get everything you'll want. You will achieve your dreams and you'll be the most likable, right? We all are trying to improve ourselves, find the way to live our best life. And quite frankly, I think it started all the way back in the, in the, Garden of Eden at the fall, when ultimately we look at how sin came into the world, when Eve ultimately wondered if God was holding out on her through not giving her everything she could have through um, this forbidden tree. And, and we don't need to go into all that, but the truth is what started there wasn't just the temptation of a fruit. It was the wondering that maybe I need to reach out and get for myself something I don't quite trust God for. Mm. And I think my heart and the where I long for women to find freedom is the realization that every time we pick up another book or another formula, sign up for another workshop, nothing's wrong with those tools. But the more we think that it's up to us, 
the more exhausted we become, the more we think that we have to sign up for more and more and more self-improvement. What we're really made for is actually to find our identity, our worth, and our wholeness in who God made us to be. And the only way we can find that is actually to know who God is and who he says we are. That's the only way. It doesn't mean that we don't um, sign up for a class or read a good book or work on our communication skills. No, those are good tools, but those in themselves will not save us. And at the end of the day, I think it's our own hero complex. It's Mm -hmm. our sense of thinking that we're going to save ourselves and that we are the heroes of our own lives. That's what's causing us to be so exhausted, constantly comparing, thinking if we measure up to our neighbors, the the next person in line or anyone around us. Um, I want more freedom for all of us. Oh, such a good point. Yeah, Yeah. Ruth, let let me just push back a little bit with that because I agree, I'm nodding my head, and I think our listeners are as well, like I'm gonna presume they are, but we fall off the, the wagon, so to speak. And how do we get back on? Because at the end of the day, I, I wanna do what you just said, but I struggle. So how do you guide us at that point? Listen, I do too. So I will absolutely tell you, this is not a one and done thing. This is not like, wow, after this broadcast, we're all gonna just be like, goodness, we can just take the rest of the day off and rest in (laughs) our self-worth and not do anything anymore. And then like, let me just tune out and not turn on social media. So I'll never feel like this again. No, 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 you got to start making breakfast. You got to start making breakfast. Right. I mean, those eggs are waiting for me. No, but here's the thing. This is the truth. The truth is that there will be lots and lots of lies in a narrative that's crowding your brain from the moment you wake up to the end of the day, Mm. unless you replace it with something that's true. Mm. And so your brain will constantly fill in with things like, you need to be more, you're not good enough, you need to be more religious, you need to be more organized, you need to be all these things. And unless you go to the character of God and go to the good news, the good news of the gospel, which all it is, is the good news that Jesus saves and you don't save yourself. If you have to go back to that truth and replace the lies every day and say, and so this is what I do. Can I just share with you? Yes, uh, that'd be great. Practically, that I wake up in the morning and I hope I'm not the only one that sometimes feels the immediate sense of, oh my goodness, I don't know if I can do today. Mm-hmm. I have so much on my plate or, oh my goodness, I'm already, I already feel like I'm a disappointment. Whatever it is, those narratives that are going on in your mind, I actually have to stop myself and say, Ruth, what is true about who God is? Mm-hmm. Is he a loving God or is he sitting there with his arms crossed and holding out on me? So I have to go back to my, the Bible and say, let me read about who he actually is. And then I have to say, okay, so if he is God and I'm not, what did he say about who's in control today. And I remind myself that he holds all things together, not me. And so then I start my day off remembering, doesn't mean that it comes easy, but I keep responding responding to life's demands and I keep rehearsing the truth, meaning I tell myself and I remind myself, hey, that thought is not actually true. What's true is God is still in charge and he loves you and he cares for you and he's defined who you are, clearing your inbox, and getting everybody perfectly fed and dressed and having your house perfectly clean, that's not your self-worth. So those are the conversations I have regularly. Regularly, I really like the fact that you focus on the words, you rehearse the truth. Because exactly. isn't that so true? We need to remind ourselves. We need to rehearse the truth as if we're in a play and we're learning our lines because it's so easy yeah. when we look at our to-do list and be overwhelmed and we forget that he Absolutely. has is still there and he is our source, our, 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 the water that we need to drink from every day. I really appreciate that word and I know our listeners will too. Well, Ruth, we're almost out of time. So let me ask you the, the burning question. <laughs> how do you juggle it all? Uh, how do you prioritize from writing, uh, creating and taking care and of six boys? you're an amazing artist, by the way. I just want to mention that. Amazing. Mm-hmm. How do you do it? Well, I mean, this I didn't make this up and this is not... Um, anything but the most practical advice I can give is you really think through what has God called me to that only I can do. Mm -hmm. And then you 
ask for help. You encourage others to come alongside you. If you don't ask, if you don't invite, you may never know who is gifted and willing and excited to come alongside and, and work with you. Whether that be a helper at home, or it might be somebody who you can bring on staff, or it might mean just having a friend along to champion everything that you're doing. And then you learn to say no. You learn to say, hey, um, if I'm defined, like we've been talking about this whole broadcast, if my self-worth comes from Christ and what God has done for me and not by what I do, then the person that I am is not defined by whether or not I show up to that party or not. I can say no if it doesn't fit in my schedule. So then the, the, the expectations and the FOMO and all the weird things that happen when we think that we have to say yes to everything kind of fades away and we can prioritize and really stick to being faithful with exactly what we need to be doing in this particular season. That's the only thing I know to do um, in my I mean, I'm learning as I go too. I'm a work in progress, but that's what I do. I, I learn to invite people to join in and I say no to a lot of things. Well, Ruth, you know, it's been such a pleasure to speak Absolutely. with you. You've given us so many wonderful nuggets to share with our viewers today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. All right, everyone, stay with us. We'll be right back. Hey, I'm Mike Sherbono, and I just want to say thank you for watching The Perspective. And part of my dream is that through the perspective, we'll be able to communicate God's love across Canada and even further. And because of your partnership and help, this has actually been happening. Can I ask you today, as you think about your involvement, about being a partner in helping people hear the good news of Jesus Christ, would you go to the link below and click on and consider becoming a monthly partner with me as we seek to encourage and bring hope and healing into the lives of people across our country. Thanks for partnering with me. You know, Julie, I love the conversation with Ruth, and I know one of the things that caught you, because I'm, I'm starting to read you, you know, fairly well, you know, the whole part about rehearsing what is truth and not the lie. Expand on that. Yeah, I think I've shared many times in the show before I've dealt with, you know, uh, struggling thoughts and negativity. And so it's easy to get into the spinniness. And, and she made it very clear that we need to rehearse what God says. And when we turn and we read the word and we start reminding ourselves constantly uh, what the word says, that really starts to change our thought process and really helps start the day off right and reminds us this is the way we need to do. So that rehearsing what God says is so important for and us. And you know, I don't think it's just in the beginning of the day. There are times we just need to pause and say, wow, I'm really going down a negative path. I'm going to be teaching out of Second Peter. And in a couple of days, we're going to talk about taking captive septic mm. thoughts. And we need actually to soul detox. We got to get rid of some, the negative things like bitterness, uh, criticism, a, a bunch of stuff like that that can just drag That's us so down. Good. Yes, so good. Well, listen, on that note, stay with us, everyone. We're going to be right back with Mike and the Word. You know, sometimes I'd love to be a fly on the wall, and uh, I'd love to be a fly on the wall in Ruth's house with those six guys all around and, and hearing some of the banter that was taking place and that is taking place between her boys. I'm sure there were lines something like this, you know, hey, baby, it's time to grow up. Uh, and uh, guys can actually be much tougher than that, but maybe the mother would say words like that. It's time to grow up or stop acting like a baby. And what I want to talk about for the next several days is what it means to grow up. How do we grow up in our faith? How do we become the people that God wants us to be? And Jesus talked not about making converts, but he talked about making disciples. Disciples are followers of Jesus. And we come to 2 Peter chapter 3, and there's a final verse in verse 18, and it says this, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and forever, to the day of eternity. I want to just dwell on that phrase, to grow in grace, to grow up, to stop acting like a baby. In Hebrews 5 verse 12, the, uh, the writer to the Hebrews actually admonishes the people, and he says, you know, you're still on milk. You need to be into the meat of God's word. You need to discover uh, his will and live it out in your life. 
it's very easy for us to get stuck in a place where we just say, yeah, I want Jesus to be my savior. It's kind of like a life insurance plan, but it's a whole other thing for him to be our Lord. What does it mean to radically follow him? And so Peter writes, he says, grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior. Grace is God giving us what we don't deserve. Grace is what God gives to you and I so that we can flourish. But how are we going to flourish? I need to have a knowledge of who God is. I need to have an understanding of what is going on all around us so that we're equipped to stand. And if you read the final part of 2 Peter chapter 3, you're going to discover that Peter is talking a lot about what's going to happen as we head toward the end of time. Now, one of the things that he says earlier on in his letter is that people are mocking and making fun of the Christian because they say, well, where is the Lord? He said he's going to come back, but he hasn't come back yet. So let me read to you the first thing of how what we have to grow in grace and knowledge about. And it's all about waiting, waiting for God's time. And perspective and patience are part of God's plan for your life. God wants you to understand that time is different for him than it is for you and I. So here we're going to read it in verse 8. He says, don't overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. So I need that perspective on time, that how God views time and how you and I view time is different. And in the midst of that, we are called to trust him. And then it says, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. What's his promise? That he will come back. The idea of being slow suggests something of being impotent, uh, no power, or not able to deliver. God is able to deliver, and he will deliver. He will return. Matter of fact, you can't read the last part of 2 Peter without realizing that it's a very sobering passage as it talks about what's going to happen in the end time. But here's the heart that keeps coming out. Because the reason the Lord is slow in coming back and waiting, it says, he is patient toward you, not wishing that anyone should perish, but that all should reach repentance. God's heart for the world is that people will come to him, that they will repent of their sin and know him. And so as we look at what is happening in the world um, right now globally, as we ponder what's happening between Russia and Ukraine, as we, we look at what is happening with China and the alliances with the African countries, we need to realize that God has things in control, but he is longing for people to come to know him. He is waiting. Can I just talk to you for a moment today? I want you to know that God has been waiting for you to come home, to come to him. And he's inviting you today to repent of your sin. Folks, it's a wonderful thing when we repent because then we discover the forgiveness of God is like being washed clean. And he's extending his love to you today. You could just simply say, Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner and I'm asking you to forgive me. I want to walk with you. Will you fill me with your Holy Spirit and with your presence? And God has always promised to hear that prayer. If you're praying that today, write to me. I'd love to help you in this journey called life. 